Giuliani. Um, uh, Rudy Giuliani, who, who doesn't remember that election in 1876. <laughs> uh, but, um, Sorry about that, Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> vaguely. Uh, Professor, is it possible for the legislature, if they assume the authority that is theirs under the Constitution, uh, could they make findings? They could, of course. Fact, based on they could make findings. For, for uh, example, based on the investigation they've conducted today. They had they had evidence presented today. They've had affidavits presented today. Assume they had fulsome evidence of three or four violations. Could they make those findings? They could. And and I would encourage them, if they were to take this step with the resolutions I have recommended, that they preface the resolution with a set of findings. And, Professor, what presumably um, action like this will be challenged in the Supreme Court? Should they take this action or some other legislation? How do you see that argument? Well, it, it, it could get to the Supreme Court or it could um, be presented to Congress at the joint session of Congress when they begin opening the ballots and uh, and counting the ballots. And if you have the, the governor's certified slate of electors yeah. mm -hmm. and a legislative uh, certified slate of electors, unfortunately, uh, Section 15 of Title Three is um, embarrassingly ambiguous about which of those slates of electors uh, ought to be counted. It, 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 and the 12th Amendment is also a bit ambiguous about who has the final say-so in making that determination. I think a very credible argument can be made that it's the president of the Senate as the presiding officer of that joint session of Congress. The rest of the two houses are supposed to be there to observe according to the statute and the, and the 12th Amendment. Um, but of course, this is an unresolved issue and there's scholarship going both directions on that question. And I think at that point, uh, given, the, given the confusion of both of, of the 12th Amendment and the, uh, and, the, and the federal relevant statutes, I think the Supreme Court may very well weigh in. Now, if they do, in fact, uh, have a rational basis for their decision, either based on the law, as you pointed out, or based on factual findings as well, isn't it likely, uh, assuming that that's correct, that the Supreme Court would recognize the power that was being granted to the state? in this area and give it some degree of deference. I think, I think based on the McPherson decision and the Bush versus Gore decision, both the majority per curiam opinion and the concurring opinion by Chief Justice Rehnquist, the late Chief Justice Rehnquist, that would be where I would suspect the majority of the court would go. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. All right. Yeah. S Senator Heath. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Professor. Thank you for your presentation. One, I'm sorry, one okay. One, one procedural problem that they have is they need to have a special session. Now, given the fact that this power that they have comes from the Constitution of the United States, is that guided by procedures that would govern Florida law? Or could they call a special Florida session? Law. Georgia. Georgia law. Georgia law. Oh, did I say Florida? We're, yeah. we're going. We're going back, back 20 years. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So, so I mean, we've not had that precise issue confronted like as a holding, but uh, in the McPherson case, the Supreme Court specifically said the legislature has plenary power, and even the state constitution cannot restrict that power. So if there's some provision in the state constitution that says you can't call a special session in order to exercise powers you have from the federal constitution, I, think, so. I think the federal constitution trumps that. And I think the Supreme Court's decision in McPherson supports that conclusion. I agree that it trumps it, Professor. 